Okay, welcome back. It's time for week two. We're going to be studying uh, a number of things. The two chapters this week instead of three, so that should be good. Um, the first chapter is going to be about light and telescopes. So we're going to learn a little bit about how light works, how it behaves, some of its properties like frequency and wavelength, what different kinds of light are and how they behave. So there's visible light, which is just a tiny slice of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then there's radio, microwave, infrared, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma radiation, which are all different types or flavors of electromagnetic radiation, which is, of which visible light is one flavor that we can measure with our eyes, that we can see with our eyes. But we can measure all the different kinds of electromagnetic radiation with appropriate instrumentation. We'll learn about telescopes, uh, optical telescopes, radio telescopes, and other types of telescopes for measuring different kinds of radiation. We'll also learn about atoms and how atoms produce and absorb radiation. So the reason radiation is interesting is because that's the only tool astronomers have to get information from space. Basically, everything we know about the world outside our direct uh, physical connection on the surface of the Earth is through the electromagnetic radiation that we receive at the Earth. So we need to know about light in order to understand it as a vehicle for conveying information about the rest of the universe. And it turns out light interacts with atoms. And so and the rest of the universe has atoms in it, and so we need to understand something about atoms in order to understand what the light is telling us. So, there you have it. So, if you have any questions about any of the things, I don't, I'm not going to just go over every single thing in the book, because that's what the book is for, and there are lots of great uh, videos and interactive tools that you can use to investigate that stuff. But if you do run into questions, if you're confused by something you read, please don't hesitate to post that to the forum or send me a message. One of the things I had hoped would happen more than happened last week was that as people encounter difficulties, they would post to the forums and uh, you can get help from your classmates and you can also get help from me. But if you don't tell me that stuff's happening and that you're confused or you don't know what to do, then I have no way to help you. So I would really like to help you. So please, let me do that. Let me know if you're confused. So, uh, the, la the last thing we're going to do is from chapter 5, I guess, is uh, to understand a little bit about the sun. The structure of the sun, what different parts it has, how it basically works. We'll get more into the sun later when we get to stars. But for now, it's just sort of what are the observational properties of the sun? What do we know about some of the parts of the sun, I guess. Okay, So, the project this week is to measure Jupiter. So, we're going to learn how to find Jupiter in the sky. I'm actually, you guys should know enough at this point that you can do that. So I'm going to let you go ahead and give that a shot, figure out when Jupiter should be visible, figure out where you need to look to see it. If you have trouble finding it, then let me know. But I think that at this point, uh, based on what we did in the first three chapters, you ought to be able to figure that out. You can use Celestia, you can use a bunch of online sources for finding things, or you can ask, and we'll have a conversation about that in the forum or in the messages. But I do want you to record your observation of Jupiter, much like you did with the Moon observation. Let me know where you were when you measured it, what time was it, uh, how did it appear, where was it in the sky, how far above the horizon, and in what direction did you have to look to see it? We want to go to the micro-observatory system. So I want to actually demonstrate that. So let's pull up a new window here. And I'm just going to Google micro-observatory. And we're using the Observing with NASA link, so I'll click on that. And the first thing we want to do is to actually measure the moons of Jupiter. So what I want you to do at least two times during the week, ho hopefully early, like Monday or Tuesday, uh, or I should say Monday and Tuesday, you, you need two separate observations. Go ahead and cl click on the link here to observe Jupiter's moons. And uh, you don't have any choice about the field of view. You're going to click 
uh, one degree. The exposure time for Jupiter's moons, really, that works best, is two seconds. If you go too much more than that, they get overexposed. If you go less than that, they're underexposed. And we don't have any choice about a filter. We're going to just let all the light through. And uh, that's it. And you say go. Then there's a little form you have to fill out, put in your email address. You need to put your email address because that's how they send you the pictures, is by emailing you. Um, I've accessed it more than 10 times now, so I should change that. And, uh, and there we go. So, we have, we have requested images from Jupiter's moons. That's it. So what's going to happen is, I'm going to go ahead and jump to the uh, result. Is a, In the next day, probably, you'll get an email like this. It looks like it took three images. And I can look at these images by clicking the Access the Image of Jupiter's Moons here, here, or here. Uh, this one looks pretty good, so I'll go ahead and click on that one. Now this one actually, let's see, this was this was taken on the 16th. That was oh, that was only yesterday. I guess this was the yesterday one. And uh, it looks like I've only got three moons this time. The moons all usually line up in a line here. And there's a video later on where I'll show you how what you do with that. But basically, to get the fits image, you click on this link, and it downloads an image. There we go. Down downloads an image that then you can use. I double click that guy, it will open up the uh, micro observatory software, which I've already installed, and it will load the image in there, and then I can uh, I can analyze it. So I'll show you the details of exactly how you analyze the image in a little bit, but I wanted to describe for you how you actually acquire the image. So there it is. There's my image. Okay, very exciting. So I'm going to go ahead and close that one. And I'm going to go back. Let's see. I also want to point out um, later in the semester we'll be using this same facility to measure some other things. But for right now, we're just going to be doing Jupiter's moons. Oh, downloading the software. You click Download Software, and then you choose your operating system, and you download the software that's appropriate for your operating system. So that's all there is to that. Okay, let's go back to the project. So you're going to schedule two measurements on microobservatory.org and get the FITS images for those guys, and then add, use the software, as I'll describe later in the movie, use the software to analyze your data. Then you're going to add rows to a spreadsheet. So there's a link at the bottom of the assignment to this spreadsheet. Here's all the data I collected up to row 34. And here's what it looks like. It looks like a mess over here. This is basically for each day that I measured. So 57, 135 is a Julian date. 57, 135, let's see, what would that be? 57, 135, that must be... Uh, April 23rd. So that was April 23rd. So if I go back over here to 57135, there it is. Uh, what do I see? I see a zero, and I see three moons with positive e extent. Jupiter is at zero, and these guys both are to the right of Jupiter. So if I go back to that guy over here, you'll notice I've got three positive numbers here. Those are the three positive distances to those moons, and I couldn't see the fourth moon, so I just put in a zero. So you'll notice there's a lot of zeros here because on many days one of the moons is either in front of Jupiter or behind Jupiter or perhaps two moons are so close together you can't tell them apart. So we just put in a zero for those times. Um, you'll also notice that this thing looks like a terrible mess but you'll notice that there's this one moon that goes way out, goes way out here, goes way out here. That guy is Callisto. Callisto is the farthest of the four Galilean moons from Jupiter. And so we can't really identify which of these points belongs to which moon, but we can say that these guys have to be Callisto. So you can use these data points to estimate the angular or the number of pixels between Jupiter and Callisto's farthest point from Jupiter. Okay? So I want that's part of the deal. Let's go back. 
uh, you're gonna, what you're going to do is take your two measurements and add them as two additional rows at the bottom here. And then you're going to adjust the graph. If you go into the graph and you do advanced edit, and then you click on start, you can adjust this range to include two additional rows. So change that G34 to G36 after you add your two rows in there. That's all. And then you'll see two more days worth of data out here. Okay? And the point is that's not enough in and of itself. Those two rows aren't enough to do the analysis we need. But I want to make sure that you know how to do the steps. Given enough time, you could have accumulated all this data over three days, just like I did. Okay? And uh, that's the idea. So I want you to uh, use the scale factor. We average. The scale factor here varies from night to night. Some nights the image was 5.16 arc seconds per pixel. Other nights it was 5.19 arc seconds per pixel. The average is about 5.185. And so you can use that average scale factor to compute the distance in arc seconds of the moon from Jupiter. Then once you have the distance in arc seconds, you can use the small angle formula to compute the actual physical distance of the moon from Jupiter. But for that, you need to know how far Jupiter is from you. So for that, I've got, I went to Wolfram Alpha and I asked, what's the current distance from Earth to Jupiter? Wolfram Alpha very kindly responded with a result. Um, and it turns out it's 5.461 astronomical units. Now the other thing you can do is to go into Celestia and look at the distance, and it works out about the same, but this turns out to be more accurate. With Celestia, there's a problem of trying to make sure that you're really lined up correctly to measure the distance, and it's, it's tricky. This is obviously straightforward. So that's my plan. Go ahead and use the Wolfram Alpha result. Use the angle that you get from the graph and compute the actual distance between Jupiter to Callisto when Callisto is at its farthest point. Now, use the angle versus time graph. So the point is, Callisto goes out here, comes back here, then goes back out here again. So the time for an orbit is something like the time between here and here. So I want you to use your graph to estimate that time. When you're done with those two estimates, I want you to look up how far Callisto should be from Jupiter and how long it should take to go around. And I want you to compare your numbers to the published numbers and describe that comparison in your report. Okay? You need those two guys. And finally, once you've got those two numbers, the period of the orbit and the uh, distance, the size of the orbit, the semi-major axis, basically the distance between Jupiter and Callisto, then you can compute the mass of Jupiter. I want you to estimate the mass of Jupiter. I want you to compare that to a currently published value for the mass of Jupiter, and I'd like you to describe that comparison in the report. Now obviously you're going to have acquired some of the data that you're going to use, but I acquired most of it, so I need you to explain that in your report. Say, uh, I received most of this data from a spreadsheet provided by Dr. Spicklemeyer. So anytime you use data that you didn't personally collect, that declaration needs to be there. That's part of academic integrity. That's just part of integrity. So at the bottom here, I've got some links. What is a Julian date? Uh, the answer is a Julian date is just a, a number, which is the number of days since some time in 4000 something BC. And the modified Julian date is the number we're using, is that number minus something like 2.4 million. As far as we're concerned, basically, it's a number that represents time measured in days. So between 5.7130.031 Julian date and 5.7131131031, that's a 24-hour period. Now, this is greater than 24 hours because this guy is a little bit later. This is greater than 24 hours. This guy is a little bit later, and so on. So you get the idea. This represents time. And uh, I'll explain how you get these Julian dates uh, when I describe how to use the observatory software. So that's it. Let's see, what else do I have here? Um, ah, 
I did a somewhat more careful analysis of the data and I pulled out a fit of Callisto's orbit and once you see that fit you can see that on each day Callisto you can figure out which of these points actually is Callisto although it's not easy when they're all mixed together and I also wanted to point out that once you did that you could remove that data and then look at the data that's left and you'll notice that there's another moon that goes out that would be the, like Io that's, no that's not Io yeah, Ganymede I think um, the next moon and then you could fit it and pull that data out and go on so you can disentangle this mess through a mathematical process of getting rid of one moon at a time all right so oh this is the Julian date business so let's see what else do we have here uh, oh here's a link to the fits files that I collected in order to get my data if you wanted to repeat any of my measurements or you want to see what those files look like you can go and grab those ones Here's a link to the spreadsheet, this spreadsheet, that has my data in it and has the graph. Now, you won't be able to edit this spreadsheet, but you should be able to go either and download it or to make a copy. So that's what you'll want to do so you can work on it yourself. And uh, the Jupiter distance is simply a link to this uh, Wolfram Alpha thing. And there's some data. Here's a, a data from Wikipedia about the moons of Jupiter. So you can use that as a published uh, number, or you can use the textbook, you can use whatever you like, you just need to describe for me what resource. Anytime you use a resource, either it's data that someone else provides you, or uh, numbers that you need to get from somewhere, you need to put a reference in your document describing how you got that number and where it came from. Okay? All right. We'll see you guys soon. Okay. Here we are. I want to take just a real quick time to illustrate for you how you get data from the micro observatory software that we'll use to analyze our Jupiter images. So I've already put some data in here. I'm getting ready to do a lot more, which I will give you guys as a starting point for your project. I'm only going to ask you to take a couple of days worth of data and put it in yourself. So I need to explain to you how to do that. I'm going to take something like 30 days of data and put it in so we have a fairly complete data set, but I want you to be aware of how it works and how the data is processed so you're, there are no magic boxes anywhere. That's the idea. So let's go open. So the last file I loaded was, uh, let's see, it was April 16th at 5.51 a.m., I guess, was with the time of the image. So I'm going to go get the next one. So I'll open a file, which I've saved here on my computer. And let me scroll down until I get to ones that I haven't seen already. So that's April 16th. That's the one I did last time. Let's go get the... Uh, actually, oh, let's go ahead and jump to April 17th. because so These two are almost exactly the same time. So I'll go ahead and... They're, they're within a minute of one another. So that doesn't really help me that much. I'll go ahead and grab the next one. There we have it. Okay, so there's Jupiter, and there are some moons there. And uh, you'll notice Jupiter is way overexposed, and that's simply because in order to get the moons to be visible, you've got to overexpose Jupiter. That's okay. I want to go to the window menu and look at the FITS header. It's a collection of data about the image. There are several things we need from that. One is the image scale, 5.19 arc seconds per pixel. So I'm going to take that and put it in over here. Most of them so far have been either 5.19 or 5.16, but whatever, whatever the scale is of that particular image, we need that in here so we can convert from pixels to actual degrees or arc seconds in the image. And then we'll need the distance to Jupiter to go from arc seconds to the actual distance between Jupiter and the moon. But that's another step. We'll talk about that later. Uh, oh, I need more from the... I didn't get that. I need more from the FITS header. I also need the file name which I'm going to grab here, copy that, and then come over here, paste it, boom. And then I need the Julian date, which is basically a measure of time. I'll explain more about that later, but we need that in the data file so we can know when this observation was made. Okay, good. We'll save, save those guys. Now what I want to do is zoom in on Jupiter here. Let me go ahead and zoom in a little bit. And it looks to me like I've got four moons. These guys are very close together. Um, 
but I have four good moons, so let me go ahead and measure the distance between Jupiter and the first moon. Looks like it's 22 pixels, so I'm going to put that in right here. And it's to the left of Jupiter, so it's negative 22. And then I'm going to go ahead and grab the next one. Mm, there we go. Negative 19. Then this guy over here on the right, let's see where he is. Go to the middle of Jupiter and drag out till I get to the location of the moon. Notice you can see a zoomed in picture of the moon in the little box on the right. Okay, that's 34 plus 34. And then the last moon is way out there. He's at 54 plus 54. Good. Okay, that's all there is to it. Okay, one thing I forgot to mention is that sometimes you only see three moons, or maybe you only see two moons, and you can only get data for a subset of the four moons. In those cases, just fill in the first three or the first two and fill in with zeros everywhere else. And we'll, we'll deal with that later, but for now we just need some strategy for dealing with the fact that, uh, that you can't always see all four moons because sometimes they're either directly in front or directly behind Jupiter, in which case they don't show up as separate moons. That's all.